And the rest of us will begin a new journey this morning, which, um, just so you know, is going to be a very long journey. But that is the journey through the book of Acts, the book of Acts, um, a series that we're going to call Unleashing the Spirit, uh, the gospel's journey to the ends of the earth. And so I'm really excited about it. Uh, This morning, we're going to talk about specifically um, uh, the sermon title, We Are Witnesses. We Are Witnesses. But before we do, uh, let me pray for us one more time. Uh, King Jesus, we are unspeakably grateful for who you are and for what you have done for us. Lord, you have forgiven us of all of our sin, past, present, and future. You have adopted us into your eternal family. You have reached down to the mess and muck of our lives and you've lifted us up to the eternal throne room. Lord, where we might see and know the Most High God as Savior, Lord, and Father, and Friend. And so we gather today humbled. We gather today grateful. We gather today hopeful of the future, God, not in the brokenness of this world, but in the God who holds it in his hands. Lord, that you're at work in this world, that you're going to continue to work until your perfect will is done and your kingdom come. And that's what we pray for, Lord, with all of our hearts. So help us, God, today, we pray as we look into your word. Speak to our hearts. Give us, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you want to say to us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I do invite you to turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one in the back of the pew uh, in front of you. Um, If you don't have a Bible at home, uh, we invite you to please take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 as we talk about we are witnesses. And so uh, just a little bit of background about the book of Acts before we get started here is that the book of Acts is the second of a two-part work. I don't know if you've thought about that or, or kind of put that together, but the uh, most commentators and scholars understand and argue that Luke Acts really should be considered as one work. They were written by, as we understand, Luke, uh, who was a physician, who was a friend and companion of the Apostle Paul, and he wrote the book of Luke followed by the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we see a continuation of Jesus' story from the Gospel of Luke, All right, we see a continuation of Jesus' story, and we see that something that characterizes, that's going to characterize the entire book of Acts is this this fact that God, by His Holy Spirit, is calling us to be witnesses, calling us to be witnesses. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning as we talk about we are witnesses. From Acts chapter 1, if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to read from Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, uh, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of God. You may be seated. Okay, so we're going to look at this passage under three headings this morning. Number one, confirming the gospel. Confirming the gospel. Number two, understanding the times. 
understanding the times. And then number three, receiving the power. Receiving the power. So confirming the gospel, understanding the times, and receiving the power. First, we're going to talk about how um, uh, we see Luke here confirming the gospel. So as I mentioned, in the book of Acts, we have a two-part work uh, and that church tradition says that it was written by one of Paul's personal companions, um, a physician named Luke. And so we, uh, we can say that because um, uh, Luke essentially identifies himself as the author, more, more or less because there are several passages in the Gospel of Acts where uh, he begins using we language. So uh, there are some points in the book of Acts where Luke is writing and he, and he says, you know, Paul did this, Paul did this, but sometimes he says, and then we did this. And so we know that the author was a traveling companion of Paul, um, most likely uh, the, the physician Luke. And so this is the second volume of Jesus' story, right? And we know this because both Luke and Acts are addressed to the same person there in verse 1, uh, a man named Theophilus. Now, uh, this is a wonderful child's name that I commend to you. So if any of you are going to have children or future grandchildren, you should go with Theophilus, uh, Theo for short. And um, it's a great name. It literally means lover of God or one who loves God. It really is a great name. Okay? Uh, I don't think Meg's not too fond of it, though, so we probably don't go there. All right. So um, it was a common name in the Roman Empire. Okay? It uh, means uh, one who loves God. And at the beginning, Luke addresses him um, in the Gospel of Luke, that is. Uh, Luke addresses Theophilus there as most excellent Theophilus. Okay? Which... At that time, that language was typically used as an honorific title, okay, of someone of who is probably of some rank and wealth within the Roman Empire. So many scholars speculate, I mean, we, we can't know for sure, but that Theophilus was a, was what, what was a, pa- what we would call a patron. Uh, that's kind of how the Roman system of things worked, but people who were of means would, um, uh, would sometimes pay for the, the, an author's expenses uh, while they were writing a book. You know, bookmaking was very expensive. It took a lot of time uh, uh, th- from providing for yourself that, that not many people were privileged to have. And in addition to that, all books were handwritten. <laughs> so uh, books were, were prized. They were, extreme, they were extremely expensive because you can imagine how costly it would be to buy something that, uh, you know, that someone literally had to write out by hand. Okay, so they were very expensive. They were very rare. Only wealthy people pretty much had them, and they were written most of the time to be read aloud because most people wouldn't have access to them. So, so, so we speculate that Theophilus was Luke's patron, uh, a man of some means uh, within the Roman Empire who had been converted to Christ, and Luke is writing to him so that he can know more firmly who Jesus is and what he has done. So in verse 1 here in Acts chapter 1, Luke reminds Theo that uh, in his first volume, he dealt with everything that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, that's interesting language, and some people think, and and it may be what Luke means, that by using that language, everything that Jesus began to do and teach, that what he intends Acts to be, or what he understands Acts to be, is simply a continuation of what Jesus came to do, right? And so, Jesus might... Uh, As we see here in Acts 1, Jesus ascends into heaven, but Jesus is still working in the world, right? He's going to send his Holy Spirit. So so Jesus' story isn't over, in fact, in the book of Acts, even though he's not physically present. He sends his Spirit to continue his work in the world. I think one one pastor wrote a book uh, on on the book of Acts called Jesus Continued, because that's kind of the image that's being pictured here. And, and so now, so we've just celebrated Easter, and uh, Easter is the greatest event that ever has happened in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you look there in verse 3, it says that uh, before he was taken up, or in verse 2, it says that before he was taken up, he had given uh, uh, instructions to the, uh, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen, and that in verse 3, he had appeared to them alive uh, by many proofs. And so we just celebrated Easter, right? Jesus, after he died, uh, physically, bodily died. He was crucified, right? They buried him. He physically, bodily rose from the dead. That is the resurrection from the dead. That is the Christian hope that because the wages of sin is death, forgiven sin wipes away the penalty for sin, which means that we will ultimately live. Jesus' resurrection, right, guarantees then 
uh, that because sins are forgiven, we too will have resurrection hope and resurrection life. We will rise from the dead as Jesus did. And it's just important to remind ourselves there that uh, Luke says uh, that Jesus presented himself alive to his apostles by many proofs. All right, by many proofs, right? So remember, you know, sometimes you'll hear this like, oh, you know, and sometimes we say this too, but, but like you talk about like faith and it's like, well, that's just faith. And what they mean, what people mean lots of times what people think of as faith is, is blind faith. But notice here that like nowhere actually in the Bible is faith just blind, right? Because faith in the Bible is not uh, just blind acceptance of an idea. Faith in the Bible is trust in a person, Right? If a person has proved themselves to you trustworthy over a period of time, you're not a fool to trust them, right? So if God has proven himself over all of human history as a faithful and trustworthy being, you're not a fool to have faith in him. You're not a fool to trust him, even if you don't always understand, right? Well, Jesus didn't just say, hey, guys, believe in me. He rose from the dead and showed himself and said, touch me. Give me something to eat. I'm alive. He proved to them. The word proof there uh, that, he, that Luke uses means is a strong word, and it means he, got, he gave them something that provides certainty. They could see and touch him and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was alive, and that was massively important for the apostles, right? Because their mission was to go and tell the world that Jesus is alive. And so he gave them certainty of that. Right? Not just a hope against hope, but actual certainty so that when they would go and literally risk their lives to proclaim the gospel, they would say, well, you can do whatever you want to me, but I know he's alive because I saw him. Jesus is alive. And so it confirms, so the resurrection confirms Jesus' identity. It confirms his teaching. It confirms that he is worthy of total love and adoration and obedience. Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, that means that his work wasn't over. Jesus was going to go away, but he was still going to work in the world through his followers. He was going away, but he was still going to work in the world through his followers, which is why Jesus told told them not to leave Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, would come. And so it's important to remember that, that when Jesus told them, right, that the promise of the Father was coming, it's not just something, I mean, yes, Jesus promised that he would, he would send the Holy Spirit, but it's actually much more than that. When Jesus refers to it as the promise of the Father, I think what he has in mind is that there, there is, in fact, the Old Testament, the ancient promise that God would, in the, in the, in the uh, last days, if you will, I mean, we think of that as like the very end of the world, but I, I would argue that the Bible talks about the last days that's beginning in Jesus' time. And that in the, in the last days, in the, at, the, at the end of the age, Jesus is going to, uh, God was going to pour out his spirit upon his people. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would be God's climactic sign that, uh, that his promises are coming to fulfillment. In fact, Peter, in just a little bit later, and we'll get to it uh, in a week or two, in, his first, in the first Christian sermon ever preached, Peter quotes the book of Joel chapter 2. Uh, which says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Oh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And this is at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and Peter is saying that this scripture is being fulfilled right in front of your very eyes. The spirit was foretold to be the great sign that God's kingdom was entering into the world. And John the Baptist, right, when he prepared the way for Jesus, he said, John said, I baptize you with water, but he who is coming after me is greater than me. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so this is what's happening, and this is what's being fulfilled. So the Spirit, then, is the sign that God has decisively broken back into the world to take back what sin and Satan were trying to steal. That's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's the promise of the Father that God is giving in this church age. And so now by the Spirit, we too can know, like his disciples, that Jesus is alive, that he has poured out his Spirit, that he will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The kingdom is breaking through, and the Spirit is at work today. Through us. 
through his people. So number one, we see Luke confirming the gospel. And number two, we see the, necess- the necessity of understanding the time. Understanding the time. In verse 6 there, it says that when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And so we see how Jesus has confirmed everyone's gospel hopes and that there soon there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the, the verses 6 and 7 here give us a little bit of insight into the way the disciples are thinking about things. They ask Jesus if he's going to, at this time, restore the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? Well, most likely it means this, right, that the disciples had the view, the common Jewish view that most Jews held, okay, that the, that the coming of the Messiah would be the restoration of the Jewish kingdom, right? The coming of the kingdom would be the fulfillment and the fulfillment of the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end times uh, would come alongside a political restoration of the kingdom of Israel. They believed uh, that uh, the Messiah, the Christ, the heir of David would be a would be a new David who would, who would uh, cast off the Roman oppression from the Jewish nation and who would make them a, a mighty political kingdom and that other nations would come down uh, and, and kind of like bow down before them. And, that, and the uh, disciples were expectant and hopeful and excited that they would be the uh, highest ranking cabinet members within Jesus' new government. Okay, which is why I remember that they were arguing, you know, John and James get their mom <laughs> to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, will you let my son sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom, right? They were, they they were going to be the big dogs, and they were excited about that. And they were, they were like, Jesus, is your kingdom coming right now? But what is interesting is Jesus, well, what's interesting is, first of all, Jesus doesn't say that that's going to happen. He just kind of pushes it down the road. But what he does say is he says that it's not their place to know the times about these matters. And in fact, if that's their greatest concern, if that's their greatest concern, they're dramatically missing the point. Because Jesus' kingdom is not first a political one, but a spiritual one. This is an important point. Jesus' kingdom is not first a political one, but a spiritual one, right? Uh, When Pilate, who was a Roman procurator, okay, a government official, right, um, uh, Jesus is brought before him, and uh, the accusation against Jesus is that he's the king of the Jews. Well, that's a, that's a very, you know, in those times, that's a very politically loaded claim, right? And Jesus, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus is kind of like, well, you say that I am. So he's kind of like, yes and no, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would be fighting for me, but my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, yes, Jesus is a king, but he's not the kind of king that you're thinking about. He's not the kind of king that the Romans need to be super concerned with because his kingdom doesn't have, doesn't have nice political boundaries on the map. The kingdom of Jesus is wherever he reigns in people's hearts by faith. This is the kingdom of God right here. Because where you bow the knee to King Jesus, where, where you are ready for Jesus by faith when he comes, when he comes back to take his kingdom for himself, there the kingdom of God is. So it's not first a, a political one, but a spiritual one. So we must understand the times and beware of the tendency to get ahead of ourselves. So I think there's two dangers that Jesus is warning about here. The first danger, of course, is putting too much hope in this world. This is a great temptation that we all face every day is putting too much hope in this world. That's one example why Jesus, I think, spoke about money almost more than he spoke about anything else because we tend to be enamored with things of this world, okay? We put too much hope in this world. So one exa- another example of this would be maybe putting too much hope in politics. Uh, Modern-day America idolizes politics. You know how I know that? Because of how angry people get. You want to know somebody's idol? Find out what makes them the angriest. That's their idol. We idolize politics today. If we can, we, we really, people think if we could just get the right people and the right policies in the right places, we can have paradise on earth. Let me tell you something. You can't. Because the only thing that can create a perfect society is if that society is full of perfect people. And the only thing that can create a perfect person is the 
glorifying power of the Holy Spirit of God that will happen on the last day. Until that happens, we're going to be broken people living in a broken world. Yes, there are better or worse political systems, and I have opinions about that. But the, the point is, is that until that happens, politics at its best can only help restrain the brokenness of the world. It can't cure it. So we must beware of, we must beware of putting our hope too much in this world. Jesus, Jesus, when Jesus left, he told his disciples, he said, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. Why? Why? He, he gave them the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. That's the mission that Jesus left. Because when we bear witness to Christ, we're, we're doing the most important kind of political work. The political work of the kingdom of God. Right? And so, and so that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the politic that matters the most, and that's the one we should be most invested in. Okay? And as we do that, and Jesus did call us to be salt and light. He called us to be the light of the world. As we're loving people, as we're proclaiming the gospel in Jesus' name, we can and should be making our little corners of the world a better place. But as long as sin remains in the world, we're, we're going to have to deal with it. All right? So the reason he gave the Holy Spirit was to be witnesses. So the first danger is putting too much hope in the world. The second danger is the equal and opposite danger, and that is the danger of being so focused on the end times that we lose sight of the present, right? They wanted their cabinet positions, and they wanted them now, right? Uh, Jesus, but, but when Jesus ascends into heaven, what happens? Jesus ascends into heaven, right? And then, and then there's two angels standing by, and they're just like up there. These two guys are like, Hey, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, uh, you can't just, we can't, we can't just stand here and look at the sky all day waiting for Jesus to come back, right? That's what they're saying, right? He, in other words, he's saying, you got a job to do. So, so, so the, the opposite extreme then is we can't be so focused on the end time and Jesus coming back uh, so that, uh, that, that we neglect the mission that God has given to us, all right? This, this is sometimes thought of as the uh, monastic tendency, all right? We, we just want to withdraw into our little kind of monasteries and just le- let the world uh, devour itself while we wait for Jesus to come back. But that's not the attitude Jesus has for us either, right? We're to be in the world, but not of the world, fighting God's battles God's ways. Uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul wrote this, He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so the work that we do is spiritual work. And we can't use, we can't use, um, we can't. You can't use ungodly methods to achieve godly ends. And that's what's always going to set Christians apart, right? Because the ends for a Christian, for a lost person, the ends justify the means, all right? You just, you do, you'll be willing to do whatever you think you should do to achieve your desired ends. But as a Christian, we're just not going to do that. And that means, humanly speaking, we're going to lose some battles. We're going to lose things because we're, we're going to play by different rules. But, the, but the, the whole point is, is that at the end of the day, this is God's world. It's God's rules. And what you don't want to happen is, is break God's rules and then be accountable for them at the end. And so we're going to, be, we're going to act in faith and we're going to act in trust, doing, fighting God's battles God's way. So we confirm the gospel. And then number two, we must understand the time. And finally, number three, we're going to receive the power receive the power. It says there, one of the most famous passages, one of the most important passages in Scripture, uh, Acts 1-8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking, lifted up a cloud, took him out of their sight. And then in verse 11, it says, uh, this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Okay, so this is Jesus, and he's given these instructions to his disciples, and, he, and so they're going to be his witnesses, but they need to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so um, they, they, they had a job to do, and we have a job to do, 
And the best thing you can be doing, right? So because the, the angel said that Jesus is going to come back, right? The best thing that you can be doing when Jesus comes back is be doing what Jesus told you to do. What you don't want to be doing when Jesus comes back is being lazy or disobedient, right? You, don't, you know, you ever, uh, kids' room, right, the door's closed, parent walks into the door, everybody freezes. What were y'all doing in here? Got caught, right? Don't get caught by Jesus, unprepared, right? We have a mission. This is the mission God gave us to do, right? It's a, a some, some theologians have called it a command promise. Cause, and and that's the, I think that's a great way to describe it. It's both a command and a promise. You will be my witnesses, right? So it's a command, go be my witnesses, but it's also a promise. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit will empower you and drive you and stir you to be my witnesses. All right? The, the, the Holy Spirit, and by the way, that's the... Throughout the book of Acts, the, the chief thing that the Spirit is given for you to do is empowerment to be a witness, right? So we talk about the Holy Spirit, and we talk about spiritual power, and the Spirit, you know, is, is life and breath and everything, and all the fruit of the Spirit come by the Holy Spirit. But one of the primary things, especially in the book of Acts, that the Spirit is given to us for is for us to be witnesses. That's that's why God gives us spiritual power, is to bear witness about who he is and what he's done. Uh, the Greek word is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. To be fair, the word doesn't mean dynamite, but it means ability, enablement, and strength to do something, right? So consistently, again, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is, is associated with two things. The, uh, the uh, boldly, pro- bold proclamation of the gospel and the ability to do uh, mighty works, often working of miracles, in order to in order to uh, vindicate and to validate the message that is being proclaimed. Okay, and so I believe that Jesus has given us the has given us the same mission by the same Spirit that He entrusted to them back then. I don't think you know. Uh, I don't think everyone's going to be doing miracles. Uh, I think, generally speaking, God gave it at that time more so. So to, to, to lay the foundation for the early church, to, uh, to, to bear witness to the, the early gospel witness, although God definitely still does miracles today. But the point, is, is that, the point is, is that we're to be, but God empowers us by his spirit to be his witnesses and to do works and mighty deeds and, and good, good works to validate and to vindicate the message that God has given to us. Okay, the spirit of God has come upon us such that we all have the ability to bear bold witness to the news of Jesus Christ. In other words, what am, I, what am I saying? I'm saying you don't need, if you're a Christian, you don't need power to witness. You already have power to witness. That's what I'm saying. We just have to walk in that. We have to believe in it. We have to, uh, to, to, to live it out. All right, you already have everything that you need to be a bold witness. All right, it's been granted to you by God. All right. Now, what is a, now what does a witness mean? So, it, you know, if you think about it, right, witness is is really kind of a legal term, right? Uh, when you, in a court of law, when they call a witness, they're calling somebody who is what? Who has seen something, right? They've seen something, and so now they're just telling you what happens. All right? Well, that's what it means to be a witness, right? The apostles, in the immediate context, right, the apostles were special witnesses of the, of the resurrected Jesus. They, they saw Jesus with their own two eyes, all right? And Jesus commanded them, called them to go and to bear witness, to be a witness to what they have seen and heard. What is it? It's news. It's proclamation of the news, right? There is, why do people watch the news? Because the news doesn't necessarily tell you what to do. Well, sometimes they try to, but <laughs> the, the, the news is supposed to be uh, something that has happened that you might be interested in or, more importantly, right, that, that might have some bearing on your life, right? There are some events that take place that should affect your life, right? If, if the news came on today, God forbid, and World War III was about to start, that would concern you because it would have a bearing on your life. Well, 
if somebody busts in, if somebody busts into your Roman household and said a man rose from the dead, that concerns you. It concerns you. Because a man rising from the dead has something to do with your life. And what are you going to do about it? They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, to witness to this all-important event that Jesus Christ is alive and that he saves completely everyone who turns from sin and trusts in him. That's what Jesus did. That's what he came to do. And this witness was to begin in Jerusalem and then extend to Judea and Samaria and all the earth. So Jerusalem is a historically important city, one of the most important cities of the world. Jerusalem stands as the epicenter of Christianity. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, and then later the Holy Spirit was poured out in Jerusalem. But the point is that the gospel couldn't stay in Jerusalem. Judea was the area surrounding Jerusalem broadly, and then Samaria was the region north, the northern part of the, of the nation of, of Israel, uh, going up in, towards Syria. And then, of course, the ends of the earth is the rest of the world. And most, most people who have read the book of Acts recognize that in Acts 1-8, uh, Luke is actually given an outline of the, of the rest of the story of Acts because the first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit falls down in Jerusalem. They proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem. Peter does, and 3,000 people get saved. And then, uh, and then through um, uh, Philip and, and, and some others, uh, the, the, the gospel witness goes out into Samaria, and then it starts going out into the rest of the world. So this is the, the, the thematic statement of the book of Acts, okay? But what I want you to think about here is that when we think of Acts 1a, what we typically think of is, well, you know, Eastman is kind of like our Jerusalem, and then we got to go to Judea, so we go to like Dodge County, and like the rest of Judea or Georgia, and then Samaria is kind of like, you know, maybe the rest of the country, and then to the ends of the earth is like foreign missions, right? Like that's the way we think about Acts 1 8. But I want, what I want you to think about though also is that from Jesus' perspective and from the, the perspective of Jesus' disciples, right, where do we land in that? We're not in Jerusalem. We're not in Judea. We're not in Samaria. We are the ends of the earth. Have you ever thought about that? We're the ends of the earth. My mom's from Thailand. You might be from European descent, from African descent, okay? Why are you here right now? Why are we here right now? It's because 2,000 years ago, a handful of men were told that they needed to be witnesses, and they did it. Which is why we can sit here 2,000 years later across the continent and an ocean telling other people that Jesus is alive. Because for 2,000 years of Christian history, they obeyed it. And not just the disciples, right? Because the disciples didn't live 2,000 years. But but the, the ones who they told, people just like you and just like me, told the gospel for 2,000 years so that we could be forgiven of our sin at 1100 Chester Highway today. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want the buck to stop with me. I don't want it to stop with me. I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want uh, to sit in the, re- the review of human history that I think is going to happen one day, and, and it be said, yeah, the gospel made it all the way to 1100 Chester Highway and stop there. I don't want to hear that. I want to be part of what God's doing in the world. We want to be part of what God's doing in the world. We want to be part of the throng of faithful witnesses who bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Eastman, in Dodge County, and around the world. They've done it for 2,000 years, people just like you and me, and we're going to do it too. We get the privilege to stand in line, uh, in that line of faithful people who get to pass on their faith across time and across borders. This is the call of the gospel. This is the reason why we have the Holy Spirit, right? You know, uh, Jesus didn't just save us so that we could, so, you know, so we could just you know, sit in a condo in heaven. He saved us so that we could know him, love him, and, ser- and love people and, and serve other people like he did for us. One of the primary ways we do that is to proclaim the gospel. So confirming the gospel, understanding the times, 
receiving the power. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. But as we close, I'm just going to extend this invitation to you. Jesus came. He lived. He died. He rose from the dead. And as we just heard this morning, he's coming back one day. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Um, All the nations of the world right now are just leasing property and time from him. Okay? And this great king, he died on the cross so that you might be forgiven of your sin. And so if you don't know Jesus today, or if you're not not 100% sure that if Jesus came back right now, which could happen, all right, that he would know you and you would know him, today's the day. It's the day for you. It's the day God has appointed to you. You can turn from your sins in your heart right now. You can trust in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He can hear you. He can hear your prayer if you just call on him and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. And he will. And he'll give you a spot, uh, the, a certificate of citizenship into the eternal kingdom of heaven. The invitation stands, and I pray that you'll accept it. Let's pray. King Jesus, Lord, there is none like you in heaven or on earth. You rule and reign over all things, God, and we're not worthy. We're not worthy to belong to you. But you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And not only that, Lord, but you've called us so that you can use us, Lord. And, I, and I'll be the first to say, Lord, that sometimes I just don't, I don't feel like I can be that useful. But, Lord... That's your glory, God, to use crooked sticks to draw straight lines. It's your glory to use the mess of us, God, to to point to a perfect Savior. And so, God, I pray that we would walk in the fullness and power of your Holy Spirit. God, we pray this morning as Hillside Baptist Church, we pray with all that we are that, that the gospel wouldn't stop here. God, that this would be a launching pad, God, for your gospel to go forward for the next 2,000 years if that needs to happen, God, until you, until it's the appointed time of your return. So, God, let us be faithful. Let us be bold. Let us be courageous. Use us, Lord, for your glory. And, Lord, maybe there's someone in this room this morning, and they have yet to surrender to your good, kind, and faithful rule in their life. Lord, I pray that they would see that that you're a far better Lord than Satan and a far better Lord than themselves. You know us and we were made for you. And I pray that they would surrender by faith today. Lord, we, we worship and adore you and surrender ourselves to you to give you the glory that you're due. In Christ's name we pray.